a financial of various listed and unlisted companies across sectors. His valuation uh, experience includes valuation for purchase price allocation in M&A transactions, valuation of debt instrumentation, uh, to in instrumentations and valuation of intangibles apart from generic equity valuations. Uh, thank you, Alhar Deshmukh, for taking out time for this webinar today. We are really excited to hear from your vast experience in this field. Over to you, Alhar Deshmukh. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction, Dara. Yeah. Uh, so in addition to what you just mentioned, uh, the more focused, the more emphasis was on valuation. But I guess today's session is inclined more towards, you know, uh, knowing uh, or rather informing the candidates whether to pursue a career in valuations and mergers and acquisition practice or not. Uh, so I will be, you know, uh, to be very honest with you from academic point of view, uh, I may not be the right speaker, but it will be my pleasure to share some of my own experiences, uh, which will help through today's, you know, candidates, attendees to, you know, understand uh, about this particular industry. And that will help them take, you know, uh, informed decisions for their careers. Uh, so before we begin, uh, I would like to, you know, just give you a presentation about uh, what is the major acquisition all about. So uh, can I share the screen here? Yeah. Yeah, is it visible now? Uh, yes. So mergers and acquisition is a part of larger terminology named as corporate restructuring. So when we speak about corporate restructuring, it does not, it does not only include you know, one company acquiring the other company or two or more companies to, coming together to merge. Uh, corporate restructuring is inclusive of everything. It includes not only mergers and acquisitions, but demerger, some buybacks, capital reduction transactions, doing joint ventures. Uh, I guess people who read business newspapers on daily basis, uh, they must be well aware about these terminologies. And it is equally exciting, you know, for especially for candidates to, you know, uh, pursue a career in mergers and acquisitions. Uh, but let me tell you, uh, the practicalities are much more different. Uh, working in mergers and acquisitions field takes a toll on your everything, not only your timelines, your personal life, your, you know, uh, apart from professional life, you want to pursue anything, you have to compromise on many things. So it is not that simple. Uh, so when we speak about any corporate restructuring transactions, uh, uh, there has to be some motive, right? Why do people, why do companies go for corporate restructuring? So there could be some strategic reasons like, you know, growth or survival. Uh, focus on its core activities where companies can, you know, uh, focus on, on its particular business and, you know, have the hive of the business, which they are not, may, may not be interested in. Uh, then it could be, you know, utilization of excess funds available with them. There could be some financial reasons like, you know, fundraising, uh, there could be some tax planning, a uh, profit making company, acquiring a loss making company, and thereby, you know, uh, utilizing the tax uh, 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 set off of losses and doing tax valid planning accordingly. There could be a reason where, you know, uh, Companies may come together, may take corporate restructuring decisions from a uh, cost reduction perspective. Uh, again, there could be some other reasons like, you know, bailout takeover, some diversification of business activities. Uh, it could be like as good as family separation, uh, maybe some divorce happening between husband and wife and wife skips come some, some companies, husband gives some companies. So there could be multiple such reasons. But the motive, why it is important to understand motive behind any corporate structuring is the motive defines the purpose and the purpose then drives the transaction. So before, as an analyst, when you are working on an AMA proposal a transaction, you need to understand what is the motive behind corporate restructuring transaction. Uh, there are some common types of you know corporate restructuring which may include mergers, uh, uh, demergers, uh, some slum sales, buybacks, and capital reduction transactions. Now, when we speak about merger and demerger, a merger is typically, you know, uh, known as combination of two or more companies. Uh, the terms merger and amalgamation, they are widely, uh, you know, uh, used interchangeably. Uh, the thing is, when two companies merge together, the transferor company, it loses its identity completely. So, by necessity, all the assets and liabilities of one company, uh, they're transferred to the other company. So, what we refer to as transferor company, transferee company. 
and by that you know shareholders of transfer company are offered uh, you know shares of the transfer company so just if you take an example uh, there is company a company b company a has shareholders p and q and company b has shareholders x and y after the merger takes place it gives rise to a new company company ab with the four shareholders p q x and y so this is a typical you know, example of a merger or amalgamation transaction so uh, i often give get a question is it uh, are the terms merger and acquisition are you used interchangeably the answer is no there is a difference between merger and acquisition so when we speak about merger in a typical merger transaction shareholders of transfer company become shareholders of the transferee company so the old shareholders or shareholders of the old company they also become shareholders of the new company but when we speak about acquisition the company which is acquiring gets complete control and uh, entire shareholding of the target company the company which is getting acquired so when we speak about merger consideration is usually discharged by way of issue of shares of the new company but you know uh, when we speak about acquisition transactions consideration may be discharged by way of you know cash payment or maybe upfront payment or the company which is acquiring acquirer company it may issue its own shares as a part of consideration now if you take example of the transaction that took place between vodafone and idea it was a typical example of merger or amalgamation and when you speak about you know a comp one company taking over entirely the other company walmart is the best example so when walmart took you know over to the flipkart uh, it was a typical example of acquisition so similar to a concept of merger there is another concept called demerger uh, demerger but i wouldn't say it is exactly similar because uh, in a sense it is exactly opposite the concept of merger in a merger two companies come together to form a one company and in the case of demerger one company is split into two or more uh, small small companies so if you take an example uh, uh, before d merger if there is company ab limited and there are two two separate industry undertaking for example a and b so going forward if the company going for d merger the undertaking b can be split into another entity for example b limited which is in control of undertaking b and the original company ab limited will be left with only undertaking a so uh, this is a typical example of d merger again there is a, uh, another example it's called a plain vanilla d merger i won't go into details because this presentation was previously drafted from the perspective of you know uh, uh, specially for candidates mba candidates who are doing uh, 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 specialization mba uh, i won't go into deep so let me quickly run through it now uh, i had one question what kind of skill set is required for the purpose of you know mba transaction and if we speak about academic skill sets then you need to have good knowledge about companies act good knowledge about sebi regulations so sebi stands for security and exchange board of india good knowledge about rbi regulations and also uh, the corresponding provisions of the income tax act 1961 now in a typical corporate restructuring uh, merger or demerger process uh, the process begins with uh, be usually called as identification of the uh, target company so just for the sake of example if you are an m and a professional and you are assisting some your, your client company for uh, you know acquiring suitable uh, companies in particular domain particular business then the process begins with identification of the target company then you undertake due diligence activity then valuation is undertaken based upon the findings of the due diligence activity then you have to draft an a scheme of arrangement then a report from the audit committee is obtained which is again approved by the board of directors which goes to the stock exchange in the case of listed companies then you have to make an application for national company law tribunal which is called as company law court then there are different meetings meetings of shareholders meeting of creditors in which different resolutions are passed uh, giving approval to the scheme of a uh, uh, merger or demerger then uh, the approval is submitted uh, the application is submitted to the register of companies and their approval is also obtained then the same is submitted to the national company law tribunal for sanctioning of the scheme once ncd sanctions the scheme we have to file the scheme with with roc again within 30 days and then we have to go with stand duty adjudication so this is the you know i have tried tried to you know simplify the process putting in uh, uh, you know uh, scheme uh, how how a merger de merger pro, uh, transaction goes through on the different stages so i'll quickly skip it because this is you know uh, i don't want to go into much details about it if you have any questions do ask me uh, you can put it in the chat box
let us directly jump into the another kind of restructuring transaction. So when is when we are M&A professional, uh, apart from mergers and acquisitions, you are, you have also deal with you know corporate restructuring transactions, including slum sale, buyback, or capital reduction. Now, when I say slum sale, uh, uh, slum sale is a typical business transfer transaction where there is no separate entity created, but an existing business is hired off or and it is sold to another entity. Now, if you put it in example, uh, if there is one company A Limited, which has got two industrial undertakings, X and Y, there is another company B Limited, we want, which wants to acquire only undertaking Y. They are not interested in undertaking X. Then A and B Limited get, get into an agreement to sell undertaking Y to B Limited. So after the transaction takes place, B Limited will, will, will be uh, uh, holding undertaking Y and undertaking, undertaking Z. And whereas A Limited will be uh, uh, left with undertaking X and for transferring undertaking Y to B limited, they'll be paid compensation, which could be in the form of cash or in the form of shares of B limited. So, uh, interestingly, you know, there could be another transaction, uh, another type of corporate restructuring, uh, which is also called a subsidization. Now, then, uh, typically putting it in example form, if there is one company having two different undertakings, say X and Y, and they also have one subsidiary company. They can form a fresh company, though they can use an existing company. It's a hundred percent subsidiary of a limited. They can transfer one of their undertakings to subsidiary company. They can, uh, uh, you know, it is again done in the form of either demerger transaction or slum sale transaction. And the result would be a limited will be holding undertaking X and V limited, which is the hundred percent subsidiary of a limited. It will be holding undertaking Y. Now comes, you know, buyback. Uh, uh, you, if, as the name indicates, buyback of shares would mean company them, itself goes to the shareholders and buys back the shares held by the shareholders. Now, uh, specific provisions of buyback are covered under Section 16 of the Companies Act. Now, in addition to the uh, normal provisions which are applicable to all the companies, if there is an insert entity, they also have to get specific approval from Securities and Exchange Board of India. Uh, in the recent past, there were a couple of transactions of buyback happening in the listed industry, listed domain, wherein you can, you know, simply Google it and find about these case studies. So, Pitlight Industry went for buyback of shares from their existing shareholders. TCS also did buyback. Uh, I guess Infosys also did a couple of years back. So, why companies usually go with buyback? Once the company buys back its own security, its own shares, the total number of shares reduce, uh, is reduced and which effectively increases the earnings per share of the company. Again, second transaction uh, type of reason could be there is, you know, uh, promoters want to increase their shielding in the company. So whenever a company declares buyback, uh, promoters don't participate. Shares are bought back from common public. So by that way, the shares held by common public are uh, reduced and thereby increasing the shareholding of the promoters. Uh, if the company has got excess three resources securities premium, buyback is the ideal way of utilizing the amount. So there, there could be certain, you know, uh, reasons behind each and every transaction. So I won't go into statutory provisions of the buyback. Then there comes the capital reduction. Now, as the name indicates, capital reduction means, you know, a uh, company reducing it paid of capital. That is similar to the buyback uh, uh, transaction, but the regulatory provisions are a little bit different. Uh, it is usually done in the case of companies which are either overcapitalized or they are not making good business, uh, which then ideally you go, uh, they go for capital reduction transactions. Uh, I will quickly skip this uh, and we will straight away jump to the question and answers if it is fine with you. Definitely. I guess this particular presentation, although it was not mean for uh, today's participants, but I guess I hope it could I could give them you know a basic about the mergers and acquisitions, rather the corporate restructuring uh, uh, and how it is dealt with, dealt with. So I guess the first question was what are different skill sets required for M and A. So if yeah. you are uh, uh, willing to get into M and A field, M and A sector as a well, whole, uh, from my personal experience, I can say that you know. Apart from the uh, typical academic qualifications, you could do chartered accountancy, you could do company secretary, you could do MBA. But apart from your educational qualifications, what is needed the most is your management skills. Uh, because uh, believe me, trust me, uh, sometimes even if you don't have uh, academic qualifications, 
uh, the transaction is so complicated that some you need to manage the transaction, manage the people around it, uh, manage different agencies which are involved. So in my opinion, management skills is the first and foremost skill set that you may need. But uh, apart from the management skills, uh, I can say that you know you would require CAPS. So CAPS stands for C-A-P-S. So that is my formula. Uh, C stands for communication, both oral and written. So whenever you are working on any m and transaction, uh, you need to be equally fluent in your written as well as oral communication. Uh, there are certain documentation that you need to draw. Maybe you have a legal team drafting it, but uh, the uh, your views, your opinions have to be clearly spelled out, have, been, have to be clearly informed, not only to your principal, but to the counterpart as well. So the first and foremost thing you need to have communication skills, both oral and written. A, second is A. A stands for analytical skills. So when you work on any m &A transaction, you need to have analytical skills in order to understand the business dynamics of your company, your client company. Uh, needless to mention, you also need to study the business of the counterpart, the company uh, 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 which your client wants to either acquire or the company which is acquiring you. Now, it depends on which type of clients you are uh, uh, supporting. So in a typical m and transaction, there are two sides, buy side and sell side. So if you're working from buy side, your scope of activities are different. Your purpose is different. When you're working from a seller point of view, uh, it becomes your responsibility that you know the transaction does not fall away. You have to hold on to it. So, uh, but doing so, analytical skills are, uh, are the most crucial point. C, A, then comes P. The third one is P. So P stands for persuasion. Uh, I would say, you know, uh, sometimes the transaction may fall apart. Sometimes parties involved in the transaction may decide to back away from the deal, deal back away from the transaction. As an m and professional, it becomes your responsibility uh, to ensure that the transaction does not fall away. Uh, you have you need to have persuasion skills. But having said that, having said that, uh, the most crucial point over here is uh, persuasion does not only mean that you have to accept each and everything that the counterpart is telling you. You need to be uh, blunt enough. You need to be uh, straightforward in order to bargain the transaction, put your points forward and negotiate the uh, transaction in a beautiful way. Uh, trust me, in a typical M&A transaction, there are different, different parties involved, not only the financial advisors, but also legal advisors. There could be some strategic people. There could be some technical experts uh, based upon the industry. Uh, it is your responsibility as an M&A professional uh, to pursue, uh, to have you know good bargaining powers and to negotiate the deal with all these people taken together. And of course, the last one, CAPS, S stands for structuring the transaction. Now, structuring uh, skills would come from your academic qualifications, of course, and your experience. So uh, there was one of the slides where I mentioned, you know, in a typical m and transaction, uh, which needs your knowledge from different perspective. Uh, now, these are typical, some uh, different regulatory provisions that you need to be aware about. So under the companies that there are specific provisions with respect to the m and &A. Uh, if it's a listed entity, you must be aware about the SEBI regulations. Uh, if certain transactions are involved where foreign exchange is coming in or going out, then you need to be also aware about regulations which have been prescribed by the Reserve Bank of India. And uh, last but not the least, you must be aware about provisions of the Income Tax Act just in order to achieve the tax efficiency. Uh, unnecessary transaction should not end up getting unnecessary uh, tax burden. It should be tax friendly. Uh, so these are some of the uh, academic or rather I would say uh, knowledge that you as an m and professional must have. So summing it up, C, A, P, S, C for communication skills, A for analytical skills, P for persuasion skills, and S for structuring skills. So I would say uh, my answer to that question is you need to have CAC skill if you want to become an m and professional. Uh, I guess, uh, do we need to again emphasize on it? So let's move on to the next question. I guess next question was uh, from the perspective scope of the industry. Someone had written a very funny question. So I, 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 uh, I mean, I was a little surprised to read that question. Uh, the question was, what is the scope of the industry in the future? 
uh, I guess he has written, I'm a student preparing to get into investment banking, but listening to a lot of people that in the industry, it is declining. Is it true? I don't know where it, uh, which people told you about declining industry trends and uh, where did you get to read about this? My suggestion to all the participants over here is if you have any doubts, simply Google it about m and in India. You can get all the facts and figures before you. And just to put forward a couple of facts in the, in the year 2022 for the first half, uh, India completed m and deals worth $104.3 billion. And the total number of deals which we completed in India in the first six months of the year 2022, calendar 22, it is hooping 1,149. Needless to mention, IPO is another uh, uh, area which we are not touching upon. So in this six months, in these six months, there have been 17 IPO transactions so far, wherein a total fundraising of $6 billion was done. So these are some numbers which themselves prove that, you know, the industry is not going anywhere. Uh, I mean, it is going, but only upwards, not downwards. So my suggestion, don't believe these things. Uh, you can simply Google it. There must there, there are multiple study reports available, study reports of certain, uh, you know, uh, 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 some agencies like Capital IQ. Uh, there are certain big four firms. There are certain in investment banking firms like Grant Thornton and those Bain and Company. You can go through the study reports. You will also understand that, you know, this industry is never going to die for sure. So till the time companies are there, they will try to get each other. They will try to acquire each other. And, you know, as an MNA professional, uh, our work is not going anywhere. There is a hell lot of scope for MNA professionals. So I highly suggest go through these reports and you will yourself understand that, you know, this industry is quite big enough to accommodate multiple people. Uh, I hope I address that question. The third question was from the perspective of valuations and uh, projections. I don't exactly get what uh, does the participant mean by uh, valuation projections. So uh, let me just try to throw a light over basics of valuation. When we speak about valuation, uh, it always includes three different approaches. The first one is cost or asset approach. So uh, when we are doing valuation by cost or asset approach, it is as simple as taking company's balance sheet or list of assets and liabilities, trying to calculate the realizable value of each and every asset, trying to understand how much it would take to settle each and every liability, and then doing a sum of parts, total assets, realizable value, minus total liabilities, that would determine your valuation. Now, this is nothing but calculation of net asset value of a company and is typically done for asset heavy models or companies which are into, you know, uh, investment business or the company has got good capitalization. But this is typically not applicable in the case of startups where, you know, there is not much uh, assets involved, but uh, the value is driven from the future cash flows. So it uh, what what matters the what what uh, drives the valuation is companies' capacity to earn cash flows in the future. That is what we, where we come to the second approach of valuation, which is called as income approach. And the mostly followed method under income approach is discounted cash flow method. So as the name indicates, discounted cash flows. I have to map the cash flows which are expected to accrue to the organization in the future, and I have to use uh, discount it to the present value using suitable discount rate. Now, why discounting money on today is quite more valuable than money on tomorrow. If if I say, uh, Dara, if I tell you, you know, give me one lakh rupees today, I'll return one lakh rupees exactly to you after one year. Would you do it? The answer is no, because you will certainly demand some interest from me. The same reason is there. Money today is quite more valuable than money which I earn tomorrow. So that is why you have to discount the future cash flows to arrive at the present value. Uh, that is the second approach of valuation. And of course, the third approach of valuation is market approach. So as the name indicates, market. So we have to identify similar companies. If I'm valuing company X, I have to identify similar companies for operating in listed domain. I have to try to identify their uh, benchmarks. I have to identify their comparables, their multipliers, and apply those multipliers to my company in order to arrive at my company's valuation. For example, uh, there is one company which may not be exactly similar, but doing similar business and which is listed. Uh, uh, the total market capitalization of say 100 rupees and their total uh, EBIT I say 10 rupees. 
So they're demanding 10x EBITDA multiple. So if I get that 10x EBITDA multiple applied to my EBITDA, I can arrive at valuation of my company. So uh, I'm just trying to simplify the, the real valuation exercise are not that simple. But uh, this is having said that, you know, uh, uh, this market approach or market multiples are typically used for the purpose of understanding uh, what are the industry trends and whether the valuation which has been derived using the different valuation methodologies, whether those valuations fit within the range that I derive using the market multiples or not. So that is the whole ballgame behind this. But again, having said that, in any transaction, what drives the valuation is the prob probability, possibility, and capacity of the organization to derive the future cash flows. And I hope the question is from that perspective. How do we deal into valuation and projections? Right. Having I, I suppose I could give some throw some light upon uh, uh, valuation and projections. So we had, I guess, another question about fintech opportunities. Now, uh, to be very honest with you, fintech is a very, very wide terminology. So it ranges from insurance to various other industries like uh, online loans. There are certain companies, certain startups which are helping people to manage their investments. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, fintech is quite a large sector. And typically, traditionally speaking, the finance field has always been there, had always been there. But by the introduction of technology, a new terminology has emerged, which is nothing but fintech. So fintech is necessarily uh, an integration of finance plus technology. Uh, many companies, many companies these days are, you know, uh, getting startups are getting into fintech domain. So we have got multiple companies in each and every small segments of uh, fintech industry. Uh, uh, you can you yourself can get to see about different different advertisement on TV. So there are certain startups like Grow, which help you manage your uh, uh, investments. There are certain startups like Digit, uh, which help you manage your insurance using the technology. Uh, there are certain companies like Early Salary, uh, which which gives you loan easily through a mobile app. Uh, so I would like to say there are different opportunities in this industry not only from technology perspective, but if you are, uh, again, if you are a student of finance domain, uh, you know, there is always a need to understand the basics of finance because a developer, software developer will not be able to code it unless and until uh, he has got support of the finance professional. So trust me, when you do a FinTech business, you need to have the best of both the worlds, finance as well as technology. So I, I, I expect, you know, that that explains the total opportunities which might be available in the FinTech domain. So I hope that I could address that question as well. And I guess the last question I had was with respect to the m and types. So uh, what are different types of uh, m and transactions? So I could give you an example in my presentation itself, what are different types of corporate restructuring transactions? Uh, but apart from them, uh, so uh, let me tell you my own experiences. So. Any ML transaction is different from the other transactions. Uh, so the things that you get to learn, that you get to experience in a typical ML transaction, those cannot be applicable uh, to any other ML transaction for three reasons. Number one, uh, every transaction has got different purpose. So the parties involved may have different purposes. So some parties get into an ML transaction, they acquire companies in order to eliminate the competition. Some companies go ahead and acquire other companies in order to acquire new products, new technology. Now, uh, we worked on one transaction where uh, my client company was acquired by Google. Uh, my client company had developed a new technology for video streaming analysis. So if you shoot a video, they could, you know, analyze uh, different components involved in that video. It was a, you know, beautiful technology and Google wanted to uh, uh, introduce that technology in its research and development. So my, uh, for what Google did, Google gave us an offer. We gladly accepted it uh, for the obvious reasons that, you know, we were getting a good consideration and uh, the company was sold to Google. Now it's a Google company. So uh, companies do a transaction for the purpose of acquiring new technologies, getting into new products. Uh, there could be another purpose uh, uh, called as diversification. So we did one transaction where uh, my client company was sold to a big group. So my client company was into manufacturing of specialty chemicals and the big group, that group was into textile industry. 
now having said that uh, having an experience of textile they uh, uh, there was no prior uh, you know experience or i would say uh, touch uh, with respect to chem specialty chemicals was concerned but this particular buyer uh, he wanted to diversify its own business maybe he could identify some challenges in continuity of existing business maybe he wanted to just spread wings in order to you know uh, mitigate the risk involved in the industry and that is why he went on to acquire our company so uh, again it was a uh, the, uh, you know a good transaction per se but uh, yes the purpose is the one which drives any m and a transaction so uh, uh, as an m and a professional uh, uh, the purpose is the one which drives the money transaction and as an MRI, uh, uh, if you are getting or willing to get into it it becomes a responsibility to understand what is the purpose behind any transaction so uh, uh, again speaking about a further uh, experience of mine so again i was representing one seller company which was into it and itgs uh, 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 segment so what they did was they were into mechanical engineering designing services and uh, they got a offer from one european entity a big company for acquisition and we gladly accepted it uh, again for the obvious reasons the consideration was so good but during the course of the transaction there were multiple parties involved multiple agencies were involved so uh, we had to take help of our own tax professionals we had to take help of our own lawyers similarly the buyer the european company they had their own set of finance professionals they had their own set of legal uh, consultants uh, and of course uh, there were some altercations on each and every part. We argued like anything, but having said that, in any type of transaction takes place between two principles across, uh, you know, uh, the table. I would say over a cup of coffee where no consultant is present. So I want to sell my company. You want to buy my company? Let us discuss terms and terms and conditions. My professionals, my advisors will work out the nitty gritties, and then you know, do, do the transaction. So sometimes it happens. Yeah. Uh, so yes, uh, as I was saying, each and every transaction teaches you something and, you know, no transaction is, uh, can be compared with any other transaction, whether in the past or in the future. Mm -hmm. So Dara, do we have any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so we have some questions in the Q and A section. So mm -hmm. someone is asking like, uh, can we relate risk compliance to merger and acquisition? Of course, of course, yes. So uh, when we speak about risk compliance, I'm assuming that, you know, uh, I'm trying to address it from uh, uh, different perspectives. So uh, if you break down the risk, there could be multiple risk components, for example, industry specific risk. So there could be uh, sometimes some certain government regulations, uh, certain industry practices, which poses uh, risk to any typical entity. There could be some uh, risk from the perspective of economy, overall economic condition. For example, recent geopolitical tensions between Russia and uh, uh, Ukraine, they're having great impact on all, all the countries. The crude prices are going up, uh, the inflationary conditions have arose, and it would create certain economic risks. Uh, number three, of course, there could be certain uh, risk from the perspective of operations. Uh, now, what we do is uh, to mitigate the risk, uh, we usually take care of, uh, 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 undertake the uh, due diligence activity. Again, the due diligence is undertaken from the three different perspectives, Moto Moti. One is the finance and tax due diligence. Second is legal due diligence. And third one is operational due diligence. Now, we being m and professionals, we often do not have uh, industry-specific technical knowledge. But that becomes an important consideration where uh, you as an m and professional need to get help from industry experts or your client needs to you know, appoint someone from the industry uh, to undertake the operational due diligence. Having said that, uh, you as a finance professional, you need to be aware about tax provisions, you need to be aware about uh, regulatory requirements, which can help you undertake finance and tax due diligence. So uh, that will, uh, and the th thirdly, it comes to legal due diligence. Now, uh, the company uh, which you want to acquire might be having multiple legal agreements, legal contracts in place. Uh, there could be certain lapses may be intentional or unintentional, but you need to understand what could be the financial implication, which would ultimately affect the valuation and drive away the, uh, you know, uh, the deal price. So the main purpose behind due diligence activity is to understand the risks associated with it and 
the, those risks, uh, uh, what impact would it have on total valuation and effectively the deal price? So the risk assessment plays an important role. Uh, but at the end of the day, I would categorize risk into two categories. Number one is systematic risk and second is unsystematic risk. So systematic risk you can manage on your own or manageable, but unsystematic risk sometimes are beyond your control. Uh, but yes, you can always optimize and you know try to mitigate the risk to the best possible extent. So I hope I could answer that question. Yeah. Uh, there's also a student asking, I'm a working professional in accounts from two years experience. I feel I'm underpaid. What are the upskilling options I can look to be paid as per current market standards? Okay. Okay. Uh, see, to be very honest with you, uh, as I said earlier in the uh, session today, uh, I am not a uh, not an academician, but uh, uh, but from my experience of the industry, I can definitely tell you that you know uh, you need to uh, upskill yourself by undertaking different professional courses. Uh, what I have observed is in the industry, typical accountants are only graduates, uh, either BCom or BBA, and today uh, the importance of graduates is uh slowly falling away falling apart uh for the obvious reasons that you know uh, uh the accountant is categorically or rather i would say uh, typically viewed as a person who would take care of a books of account and who would only look after your regular tax compliances nothing more than that but if you want to uh, uh have a jump in your career you need to upskill yourself you need to acquire more skills and you need to acquire certain more educational qualifications. So I suggest you go for, if you're having two years of experience, you can consider going for uh, some professional course like CA, CWA, or CS. Uh, you can also consider getting one more year of, year of experience and consider new fields like uh, valuation. So you can undergo certain classes, certain courses. Uh, the concept of registered valuer was introduced back in 2019, I guess 2018 after the introduction of the insolvency and bankruptcy code 2016 and registered value concept was incorporated in the companies at 2013 wherein the valuation as a separate profession is now being recognized and in the last uh, winter uh, summer session i guess monsoon session in the parliament uh, the government was supposed to introduce valuers bill i guess this will be done later this year maybe early next year uh, and valuation uh, to regulate the valuation profession, a new institute will be created at the central level. Uh, having said that, yes, valuation would be a good choice for you. Uh, apart from valuation, what you can do is you can also consider uh, certain uh, uh, diploma courses like Diploma in International Financial Reporting. Uh, so IFR is the one I, which, which stands for International Financial Reporting Standards. So the accounting standard that we follow in India which is commonly known as ICAP. Internationally, uh, companies are following IFRS. So uh, if you have good knowledge about IFRS, you have got qualification in IFRS, then uh, probably you can also get some opportunity in large companies, in multinational companies, uh, wherein they need uh, accountant with IFRS qualifications. So I guess uh, that's it from my side. Thank you so much. Uh, there are some other questions as well. Uh, what are the job opportunities one can see after acquiring the skill set of fintech? See, uh, I'm not sure what do you exactly mean by uh, fintech uh, skill set. I'm not really sure. Uh, but, you know, of course, uh, when, I, when we break down the fintech uh, uh, part in different things, uh, what I understand is uh, a fintech industry would require not only your financial knowledge, but also uh, some technical knowledge. So uh, again, uh, I had uh, mentioned this before. I will restate this. A software developer, a coder, it he cannot simply do the coding without having support of a person who is having financial knowledge. So if you are a person from finance background, your importance, uh, or rather your involvement is equally important when it comes to fintech. Uh, what I understand is if you are specifically asking what could be job opportunities in the fintech domain, in the fintech domain, I would, I have already mentioned that, that certain, you know, there are multiple companies uh, specifically focusing on one particular segment. 
So in the fintech itself, there are certain companies who are specifically focusing on insurance. There are certain companies who are offering some loan products to mobile-based apps. There are certain companies uh, which are helping manage your wealth. Uh, there are certain companies which are acting as uh, SEBI registered investment advisors. So yes, uh, if you are an analyst, if you are a finance professional, there are many opportunities in the fintech domain worth considering. Yeah, true. Well said. Um, I am working as a wealth manager. How this course create beauty to me? My qualification is BCom plus CFP, and uh, pursuing MBA finance from LBS London. Oh, that is great. That is great. Uh, see, uh, to be very honest with you, uh, uh, I guess Dara, you would be in a better position to explain them. Uh, if okay. you are planning on introducing any specific course with respect to M&A, uh, but what I understand is if someone is really willing to get into M&A field as, a, as such, uh, uh, yes, if you want to focus into M&A transactions, uh, get into M&A domain, then uh, overnight it won't happen. Overnight it won't happen, to be very honest with you. Uh, you will need to start slowly. Uh, let me tell you my personal experience. When I qualified a chartered accountant back in 2011, I was having, you know, many aspirations. I did not want to get into traditional audit practice, tax practice. I wanted to do something different. When someone asked me, what do you want to be? I always answered them, I want to be an investment banker. But I did not have any idea what an investment banker does or what are, you know, different components of investment banking. Uh, having said that, I was very keen on getting into it. So I went on to complete master's in business finance and also completed certain other qualifications. Uh, but only after I got into the transactions, only after I got into, you know, uh, actual execution of valuation assignments, m &A assignments, I got to know about the intricacies involved. So my suggestion is uh, start working with someone who is already there in the field. He or she could be an individual freelancer or a small a boutique m and firm like ours or it could be a large M&A firm like Big Force or some investment banking companies. Start working with them. You will yourself understand whether this is the right field for you or not, whether you want to go ahead. And if yes, do you want to company with the big organization or you want to get into a freelancing, build your own empire, build your own firm. So uh, my suggestion is taste of the pudding is in eating. You eat it and then, you know, decide it whether it tastes good or not. Great. Uh, so other questions are like, yeah, definitely as a fresher, what all skills they need to have uh, as in what scope they have into the sales that they are asking. Also, there are some job loss, chances and future in the field with the view of COVID-19 also a student is asking. Yeah. So uh, let me try to address that as well. So mm -hmm. as I mentioned, uh, I had given a simple formula of CAPS. So CAPS, that was uh, the basic skill set from my experience is needed for anyone who wants to get into the m and field per se. Uh, but yes, uh, when it comes to any m and transaction, uh, the marketing skills are equally important. I mean, you might be having hundreds of educational qualifications. You might have obtained 10 different uh, certifications. Doesn't matter. If you have uh, kind of good edu uh, you know, marketing skills, uh, uh, people have to notice your presence in the market. Uh, the thing is, when it comes to companies getting sold, getting bought, uh, having the skills to present, having the skills to convince, having the skills to you know uh, 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 make the person, make the counterpart enter into the transaction is equally important. So yes, I would say that marketing skills are important. Uh, because uh, if someone has seen the movie, uh, uh, The Wolf of the Wall Street, sell me this pen. So it more or less, I would say, happens in the m and segment as well. Uh, the major, the most crucial part in any m transaction is unless the company is identified, it's scouting for suitable buyer or seller. So sometimes companies come to me telling me that, you know, we want to sell our company, but we are not sure whether, you know, who would be the uh, perfect buyer for us. For example, uh, we were working on one transaction where the company was into nuclear instrumentation. Now, the field itself is so, so discreet that there were only a handful of companies working in the room. 
and uh, uh, you know uh, the technology was involved uh, it was so highly technical highly technical the business was highly technical uh, any person who was who must be willing to diversify its existing business activities was not even ready to uh, get into this so finding the suitable buyer for my client company it was a big challenge again give me uh, uh, let me give another example uh, uh, i was approached by one particular uh, you know industrialist uh, is first generation entrepreneur he created an empire from zero uh, started with a small micro scale uh, unit some 25 30 years old back and today he is the owner of a company with a turnover of more than 1000 crores so mm -hmm. what he told me was you know i now want to uh, uh, i have been uh, growing my business organically now my son has come into the business so i want to acquire companies so that is that was his formula of you know uh, growing his business and he told me he asked me to look for suitable target companies so yes uh, had i been a marketing professional it would have been easier for me to you know scout the companies but unfortunately i was not so i had to take help of my colleague so i asked him he was a mba from marketing and he had certain presence in the market people knew him so i asked him why don't you use your contacts and find suitable companies for me so yes the thing is uh, the importance of marketing is there may it be any field and the same is the the the, the uh, importance is equally valid when it comes to m and a field as well okay yeah. yeah definitely so and one last question we have is what are the career opportunities after studying about Putting blockchain, blockchain. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so being a finance professional i may not be the right person to speak about the blockchain but from my limited experience i can definitely tell you that you know blockchain is being introduced everywhere uh just for the sake of example uh even the income tax department is moving to the uh blockchain technology uh, for the obvious reasons, of course, uh, no one can, uh, I mean, it can be backtracked and, you know, no one can uh, interfere it. Uh, so that was the basic reason, you know, even the government agencies are also now considering going on blockchain technology. So uh, certainly it is the future and there will be uh, really good opportunities, whether it is private sector, whether it's public sector, uh, whether you want to work for, you know, private entities or for domain entities. Uh, if you have good skill set, if you have good knowledge about blockchain, uh, the future is all yours. That is what I can say. Very true. Very true. So, yeah, that's come to an end. And thank you uh, for a very insightful session. I'm sure all the attendants have a lot of valuable takeaways. And we have understood like how this finance domain is also changing, evolving, and what skill set one needs to start their career. So I would also like to enlighten like a rise in collaboration with Grant Thornton offers a PG program in finance and accounting, which enables students and working people to learn from the best in the field while also getting useful knowledge. And the program also touches on some of the trending topics, right, which we have discussed also right now about the blockchain, cryptocurrency, fintech. And uh, Grant Thornton will be providing learners with a distinctive inter internship opportunities that would uh, enable them to advance and enter a lucrative financial career growth as well. Yeah, so uh, yeah, there are, I think definitely uh, all the questions are definitely uh, being answered, yeah. So thank so, you so uh, much. Just again. before yeah. we conclude, if you have, if the participants have any questions, uh, they can put a message to me on LinkedIn or they can uh, write to me. I will just quickly put my uh, email address in the chat box. Definitely, that would be really helpful for them. Yeah. So yeah. feel free to uh, send your queries to me on email. Give me a time because I may not be able to reply to you immediately, but I will definitely try to respond within 24 hours. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Hope you all had good insight from this webinar and uh, this will definitely help you with the much needed clarity for taking up finance and accounting as a domain. So thank you all. Thank you.